It's already on. Hey, we're streaming. Uh, we're going to be in Romans 8. So you can start there. You get your Bibles and turn there first. That's kind of our theme place tonight. Tonight is Your Salvation. This is Lesson 4. And um, each week we've been doing somebody giving testimony. And I asked Erin last night if she would uh, give her testimony. So I hope she's saved. No, that's um, So it's pretty important. Yeah, I don't know. So Erin's going to share her testimony to start with. And uh, let's uh, be prepared. Somebody can do it next week. Um, somebody hasn't done it yet. So, um, for you guys, like I know Rico and Jimmy have been here uh, for lesson four. So, we've been dealing with first with the Bible, the Word of God. And we looked at lesson two was on the um, God. I think it was on Jesus' name. It wasn't lesson two. The last week was on um who Jesus is. So it's, it's been good. So this week's on salvation. And I was saying this last night, even through the day today, and uh, just a good reminders of, of what it means to be saved. And that, you know, we, we've probably all gone through doubts before. We're going to get a little bit. But go ahead, Aaron. I'll let you start. Okay. And you share your testimony. Um, well, I grew up in a Christian home. It didn't start out that way. My dad was saved from the Catholic Church. And my mom was saved from the Methodist Church when I was real little. Um, so, but then... We started to build, my parents joined a Baptist church where I'm from, and um, it was during vacation Bible school. I was only five years old, and um, I don't remember, I'm like some of y'all, I don't remember the day, but it was in, I remember the place, and it was in, um, well, first, the teacher was talking about, I remember bits and pieces of it, um, and I could take it to the classroom too, but she was just talking about um, how Jesus died on the cross, and how he died for us, and you know, just going through um, everything like that. And then she said at the end of it, you know, if anyone wanted to be saved or know more about it. And I remember I raised my hand. And um, so I went with this lady into our, do y'all know what a prophet's chamber is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do y'all know what it is? It's kind of like a motel room in a church, but a little bit nicer. Um, she took me in there, and we were on the bottom bunk. And that's where I prayed to have you come in my heart. And like I said, I was five. Um, I remember praying, I remember everything, um, but then it was around um, probably 5th grade or 6th grade, I don't remember because I was at a Christian school, we had classes, those grades were together, so I don't remember which grade I was in, but um, I remember at that time, I wasn't really having doubts, I think I was more just um, kind of curious like how it worked, because I was kind of thinking, you know, maybe I have to do something else, maybe that's not all that needs to be done, and so... Um, I remember asking my mom a couple questions, and she's like, well, do you think you need to make sure of it? I'm like, no, I know I'm saved. I just, I, just, I don't know. It's kind of, when you're that age, it's hard to wrap your mind around it, I guess. And I'm a thinker. You can ask Kenny. I think a lot. And um, so I was just trying to figure it out, I guess, for myself. But I remember during that time, like I said, fifth or sixth grade, um, we were memorizing Ecclesiastes 3, like the first part of that, and, you know, all those there is time for love and time for this, time for that, and um, then we made it to verse 14, which is my life verse, and it says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, um, it shall be forever, nothing can be taken from it, and God doeth it, the men should be before him, and that verse is my life verse, because that verse reassured me that salvation isn't what I did, or um, what I could do, it's what he already did in and through me, so that's a little bit about my testimony. It's good, it goes all along with tonight's lesson. Uh, let's, let's read our verse, it's kind of our theme verse for this week. Every week we've had a verse to kind of go with the last Romans 8, 16. If you have your Bibles, that's where we are. Romans 8, 16 it says, The Spirit, and notice the capital S in that, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, lowercase s, that we are the children of God. Okay? So that's kind of our theme verse. Now. We're looking at this, uh, this thought on salvation, your salvation. Let's have a word of prayer now before we get into this and just ask the Lord to help us. And uh, as we study this together, okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come tonight to our Bible study. Lord, it's been so good on these Wednesday, our Monday nights to study and, and learn uh, more about you and your word. I pray you help us to grasp these truths. Lord, help us to uh, understand. And thank you, Lord, for saving us, for giving us the gift of salvation and the promise we have that one day we'll get to see you face to face. And uh, Lord, I pray the day will come quickly. Lord, our world is constantly changing and constantly full of wickedness, but Lord, we know that one thing never changes, and that's you. And Lord, help us to remember that tonight. Look, look, looking forward to this study together. And we ask all these things during my prayer. Amen. Alright, 
and down at the bottom there, what a wonderful day it was in life when in your life when you trust Jesus as your Savior, turning exclusively to Christ for your redemption. So I hope everyone here knows for sure they're on the way to heaven tonight. If you don't know, it's never too late. Um, you know, I used this example before, I think back at the beginning of the lesson. Uh, Steve Orange's dad, Bob, how old is Bob? 75, 76, something like that. How old is Bob? Uh, he's around there. 70-something. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's somewhere up in the 70s. But anyways, just a couple of years, a year or a half ago, two years ago, came forward, accepted the Lord as a Savior, or got assurance of that. And it's never too late. Um, I, for me, I, I shared my testimony last week. I, I thought I was saved at a young age. I really thought I was. And it wasn't until I was a, a senior of college, Bible college, where I truly knew um, that I was saved. Now, you know, I, I've, heard, I've heard people, a lot of people say, I can remember the day, the time, the place, remember that. Those things aren't important. As long as you know for sure you're saved, as long as you know without any doubt tonight that you're on your way to heaven, that's the important thing to know. And I think it's good to know the day, remember it like it was yesterday, remember the day it happened, remember everything about it. There's nothing wrong with that too, but but also I think people get sometimes confused that, well, I don't remember it, so I guess I'm not saved, or I'm not sure if I really am. All right, here's some verses. The Bible uses some metaphors. Let's go to the next page, uh, 76. It says, you pass from darkness to light. We were once in darkness, now we are in light, Acts 26, 18. We won't take time to read these. They're right there in front of your face. You can read them. In your own time. All right, another one is you were born again. All right, the story of Nicodemus. How, how can a man be born again? He was confused about that. All right, out of John 3, 16, or John 3 there, Jesus answered him, Verily, I said to thee, that except a man be born again, he could not see the kingdom of God. Not a literal, literal birth, but a spiritual birth, okay? You have been redeemed or bought back. That's a good one. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. All right, these are just phrases that in the Bible that refer to salvation. Um, then you're adopted into God's family. That's, that in itself is an incredible truth. Adoption, <laughs> adoption process. I, I've heard a preacher once explain that the whole process of being adopted and a family takes on uh, another child or brings a child in adoption itself. Many families do it because they can't have kids. And so, but God, we are adopted in his family. All right, so those are some phrases there. All of that took place the moment, that's the blank there, the moment you call on the Lord for salvation. All these things happened, the phrase we just said, took place the moment you called on the Lord for salvation. I'm curious, I'm curious, now how many of you, raise your hand, actually remember, like specifically the day, the place where you were when you truly accept the Lord? How many can remember that? All right, so about everybody here, some of you can't, that's okay, I, uh, my hand's raised, I remember. I wasn't sure, like I said before, I wasn't sure, but, but look, the time we're going to look into this tonight, if you've had doubts, I mean, how many, how many, let me ask you this, how many of you had a doubt about your salvation at some point in your life? Probably everybody's doubted it at one point. We're going to look at that tonight, some things about that. In this lesson, we'll look at some questions you may have about your salvation. For instance, can you lose your salvation? Some uh, religions teach that. What if you don't feel saved? Do you ever feel like there's days you just don't feel like being a Christian or don't feel saved? I think we've all been there too. As we answer these questions from the Bible, you, you, you'll see some wonderful truths about the gift of salvation. All right, can I lose my salvation? The first question, can I lose my salvation? Look at these. Sometimes after a person trusts Christ as their Savior, they begin to worry that maybe something they do wrong will make them lose, that's the next blank, lose the promise of eternal life. Some people get fearful, well, I've sinned today, or I've messed up today, or I've made a mistake, so am I still going to heaven? Am I still going to be able to be with the Lord in heaven? Thankfully, it's not possible, possible is a blank, to ever lose your salvation. Here's why, look at that. It's never possible to lose salvation. Will anybody ever tell you that? Will anybody ever change it? The Word of God is clear. Yeah. Nothing can pluck us out of His hand. Nothing will ever change that. I think that's the hardest thing for little boys and girls and some teenagers to think that to get to grasp that truth that we are saved. Once saved, always saved. You know what? You know what? The devil will come in and try to tempt us, say, well, you're not saved. You're doing this. And, uh, you know, even when I, when I truly accept the Lord as my Savior in college, my dad was so taken back by it, and I called him and said, Dad, I'm not going to say it. He said, no, you're all, you, you know, you made decisions. And I said, no, Dad, I'm really not. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to get confused and think different things, but I, I truly knew that I wasn't saved. But look at this first one. God's gift is forever. When God gives a gift, it's for keeps, and the gift of salvation is gift of eternal life. What a wonderful gift. We'll never, our, our, our <laughs> earthly bodies may die, but spiritual remedy of the Lord forever, eternally, forever with him. 
can't wait to get to heaven and see him face to face. And I got a lot of questions I want to ask him to see some of us. A lot of us probably have loved ones that are already in heaven, have gone on before us to see them. Think of Lee's grandpa and my grandpa's gone on before me and um, are gone. And, and so many of us have loved ones we get to see one day in heaven. And what a wonderful time it would be. I, I talk to some of the characters in the Bible, Noah, Moses, Nasa, and you know, it's going to be a joy to get there. But what a gift God has given us. All right, let's, uh, let's look at some of these verses up. John 10, 28 to 29. Who wants to read that first one? All right, Lee's got that one. John 5, 24. Who wants it? Do it. Okay. Romans 6, 23. So you probably can quote that one. Mike, you got it? John 3, 16. We all know John 3, 16. So we all know about that one. All right, let's get those verses. This is God's gift. For, it's forever. This is the promise God has for us. I give unto you eternal life, and they shall never. Skip two pages, sorry. <laughs> All right. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand, out of my Father's hand. That pluck is a strong word. Nothing can pluck it out. All right. You know, you. Um, it's easy for people to say, well, we can, you know, lose this or lose that or, or, you know, go out and pull weeds up. And it's easy to do. But think about that. Nothing will ever pluck us out of his hands. Nothing can. All right, John 5, 24. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. All right, death unto life. We're talking about one of those phrases there. A gift is free, and once it's been received, it cannot be taken back. Salvation is God's gift to us that possess all for all of eternity. It's a gift. God gives us this gift. It can't be taken back. All right, next page, 78. Our relationship, next blank, relationship is sure. Our relationship is sure. When we accept Christ, we are born again to the family of God. Once we become a child of God, we remain his child for all of eternity. There's nothing to do to cause God to disown us. You know what? I'm, I'm, my father is Ken and my mother is Ruth. Um, nothing will change me being their, their son. I'll always be their son. I may disappoint them. I may uh, upset them, hurt them, but I'm always going to be their son. You know what? Friends come. We've had friends. Many of you have friends that have come and gone. You've had some good friends, made friends. They've hurt you. Relationships change here on earth. Things may change with that. But there's one thing that's true, that God's relationship with us will never change. When we're saved, we're always saved. And we're always going to have that relationship with Him. We can go to Him. He's our Father. And, you know, I think we forget that sometimes. Don't, don't you guys forget that? We forget sometimes that we have this relationship with Him, a Father. You know, most of us go to our dads for... When I was younger for money, dad needs some money for this, or go to dad for advice. Like now, I call my dad and ask him questions, or you know, go to him. Same thing. We have a heavenly father who wants us to come to him. That relationship will never change. Then we have security. That's the next thing. Security deposit. I like this one. We have a security deposit. Uh, it says there, like earnest money, you may uh, be asked to put down for when getting a loan to buy a house. So God gives us an earnest to assure us that He is going to follow through on giving us a home in heaven. All right. He's promised us that. It's a promise. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to do anything for it. We don't have to put any effort into it. We should work out our salvation and do some things for the Lord and for the work of the Lord. We don't have to earn our way to heaven. It's not by works. We know that. Uh, it's by believing in Him. But God has promised us a home in heaven. We have a security deposit. Uh, someone look up 2 Corinthians 1, 22, and then 5 and 5. You got it? Right there. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And then five, close to 5 5, yeah, First Corinthians. Someone look up Ephesians 1 13 through 14. And it says, Now he hath, uh, now that he hath wrought us for the self same things God, who also has given unto, him, unto us the earnest of the Spirit. All right, so we're earnest there, talking about that. All right, Ephesians 1 13 through 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Mm -hmm which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You guys ever seen a sealed, a sealed uh, letter or something? It's a sealed, it's, it's, it's noteworthy, okay? You, you know that, you've seen that. That's the idea here. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. You are sealed by him. The next blank. You are sealed by him. Nothing's ever going to change that. It's secure. It's sealed. 
So you can so can you lose your salvation? What's the answer there? No. No. A thousand times. No, I like that too. It says there a thousand times you will it can't you can't lose it. It's sealed. We're sealed by him. All right, here's the next one. This is a good question. What if I don't feel saved? What if I don't feel saved? You know, once, once I think kids deal with this too, you know, uh, emotions are high, the message was powerful, the preachers preached, and uh, God has convicted our hearts, we need to be saved, um, drawn, to us, drawn us ourselves to Him, whether it's being saved or any kind of decision, and we, we, we have emotions and we feel we need to do something at the, at the moment, but then the next day, uh, we go back to feeling the same old way, and maybe we feel, well, maybe I'm not saved, or maybe I didn't make a decision. Uh, you know, uh, thankfully, salvation is not based on feelings, but sometimes our emotions don't match reality. Sometimes our emotions don't match reality. That's the first blank there. Under uh, what, I, what I what I do, what if I don't feel saved? Sometimes our emotions don't match reality. Sometimes what we're dealing with right in, and maybe our our feelings, we don't feel that way, or or maybe maybe you know what. They have things good, and, and we just, well, am I really, really saved? Sometimes a Christian, a Christian may not feel saved, and thus may doubt that they ever truly were saved. You know, sometimes, sometimes, there's times where I'm like, you know what, I, I, sometimes I do things or say things, and it makes me wonder, well, why would I do that? Why would I say that? And maybe I think sometimes I'm not saved, but I know for sure, but God wants to have you to have assurance Assurance, that's an explain of your salvation, knowing that you are his child. He wants us to have that assurance. Amen. We're, we're going to look at some of these reasons why. Look at this discussion starter over here. It's a little thing to think about. Describe a situation when you feel when your feelings didn't match reality. Perhaps on a roller coaster in an unfounded fear or result of a misinformation. Alright? Anybody have a situation like that when your feelings didn't match reality. Maybe you felt something that really wasn't going on, but you felt a different way. Anybody have anything to share? Nothing? But think about it. No, come back to that one. Think about it. How can we have this assurance? Here's some things. Here's some reasons. Here's some promises from God's Word. We have assurance because of God's promises. There's an next blank there. God's promises. I'm so thankful for His promises. Never leave us, nor forsake us. Supply every need we have. Um, he will guide us, and He's promised to hear our prayers, hear our answer prayers. And there's 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 some twofold promises for us to do things and, and seek first the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added unto you. There's twofold promises, but there's many promises in the Word of God. You know, what I challenge you to do sometime um, each morning when I get up this week and the last couple weeks I've gotten up and I I found a verse. And I you kind of learned this in the prayer bands to find a verse. I'm not sure what the guy called it there, but it was a verse that you find for your week or for the day, and you go back to that verse every morning and re remind yourself of that verse. That's why it's so important to memorize Scripture when you have a memory time in Scripture. You, know, you need those verses, promises from the Word of God. God's promise that anyone who calls on Him for salvation shall be saved. Not might, but shall. That's the blank there. Shall be saved. That's the promise. Romans 10.13 it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not a, well, maybe so, maybe if you do really good, maybe if you wear a flannel shirt and cowboy boots, you'll be all right. It's not, it's not a promise. Sorry, I'm have to in there. It's a, it's a promise. You shall be saved. All right? Then, um, the God who has promised to give us eternal life is a God who cannot lie. We know he's perfect. We know that he's never once lied. Has God lied to anybody in here before? Has He ever let you down in time before? Has, it, has He ever let you, left you abandoned or left you alone or left you out in the cold to do your own thing, left you to, to, to fend for yourself? He's never left me that way. And he's all given us His word to promise us that He cannot lie. He always keeps His promises. Some people will say, well, God did this and I can't trust Him. But God is God who's sovereign. He knows what He's doing and knows what's going to come to pass. Amen. We have assurance of God because of God's presence. Because of His presence. That's the next blank there. Because of God's presence. As mentioned before, the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit took up residence in you. But we know by His presence. You know, you ever been to those times before when you sense the Lord's presence? Mm -hmm. I think recently, uh, I think Lee and I were talking about this a few weeks ago. One day I was driving down the road and uh, I was thinking uh, of all that happened this past year. I had surgery and 
just had a hard time with that and coming out of that had therapy and all the physical things I've never had any physical problems in my life and uh, just a rough patch of time for me just on my back literally and uh, I heard a song I was listening to some music and, and uh, a song I got on the road and just started just started bawling out of control but just thinking about all that God has taken me through and uh, a song called Didn't I Walk on the Water Didn't I Calm the Raging Storms and I do all these things and a reminder to me in that moment I remember like it was yesterday I sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit in my car and and when you find those times in your guys' lives and all of our lives I'm telling you it's, it's sweet times you seek the Lord and He's there and He's ever near to you so close to you I remember a camp last summer uh, for Amy and Jenny were there and, and just a and Aaron was there, an incredible week that we sensed the Lord that week, His presence working in our lives. And so that's, that's a good reminder. That's a good assurance that the Lord, if you feel the Lord's presence, man, maybe you don't feel safe, but man, the Lord's presence is there. And He whispers those things in your ear. And you, you mind you of certain truths. And the days you feel like you're so far away, and He's so far away, and He whispers those times, that's an assurance to know that He is there. Uh, Romans eight sixteen, the Spirit of self bears, beareth witness in our spirit that we are children of God. We'll see later on, this is kind of just a side note here at the bottom there, we'll see later on the Holy Spirit also convicts us when we do wrong, so we will change. But we can resist His voice. One of the dangers of that, however, is that if we refuse to listen to His voice convicting us, we may find that we don't hear His voice reassuring us in our salvation. Thus, sometimes Christians doubt their salvation because they have blocked the voice of the Holy Spirit, giving them assurance. Many people keep sinning and sinning and sinning. Christians keep sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And breaks that fellowship with the Lord, and they don't talk to the Lord, they don't spend time with the Lord, they don't spend time with His presence, so they think, well, I'm not really saved. But really what the problem is, is sin. When I, when I was a counselor at camp, many times the first thing I would ask a teenager or a kid is, when's the last time that you spent time alone with, with God and His Word and got alone with Him? That's the first thing I counsel them. You know, a lot of times you can trace the steps back to the times when you slipped away from spending time in the Word of God and spending time with Him, that's where it began. You think, well, I'm not really saved, I'm not sure, but it goes back to not spending time with Him and His Word. And so all we simply must do is get back into God's presence, get back with Him and spend time with Him. And say, God, search me and know me and show me my wrongs. And we'll look at that more in a later lesson. All right, we're on page 80. We have assurance, not only because of His promises, but of His presence, and because we have assurance because of God's love. That's the next blank up there, God's love. We have assurance of God's love. There's absolutely nothing we or any other person can think or thing can do to separate us from our Heavenly Father. Romans 8.35. You want to read those, Lee? 8.35 through 9. Some great verses. Nothing can separate us from His love. <laughs> Preached a message on this when I was about 15 years old. Nothing can separate us. And what a great reminder that because of God's love for us, nothing will ever change His love for us. 35. 39. Yeah, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good. I love those verses. Nothing can separate us from His love. You know, we may fail Him. We may, you know, do things that don't please Him. But God always loves us. You know, sometimes it's hard. It's hard to love folks. Sometimes being married, it's hard to love one another. You, you, it's hard to look over those faults, look over those things. And you want to, and uh, you want to just get angry about it. But you know what? Even though we do those things, maybe to each other, God never looks at us that way and says, you know what, I don't love you anymore. He always loves us. That's, a, that's an assurance. The next we have assurance because of God's work in our lives. When we trust Christ or say we are made a new person. We put those old things past. We put those old things we used to do away. Uh, I think of uh, Mike. Is Mike out there? Mike Purdue, are you listening? Yeah, I'm here. Think about Mike before he was saved. I knew even he, I'm sure there's things in his life that he wasn't pleased with him doing and, and before he knew the Lord and drinking and doing things he knew he should have done and so we all probably before we were saved knew some things we used to do that we don't want to do them but that's the work of God in our lives Mike, Mike's faithful to church every Sunday every Wednesday as much as he can be 
And many folks in our church are like that. Many of you are like that. You're faithful at it. You're faithfully serving the Lord and work for God. That's assurance. Uh, God begins to work our lives in specific ways. We see his work unfold and we know it is the hand of God. Notice these evidences of salvation in a Christian's life. All right? These are evidence. These should be some things that God is doing in your life right now that prove that we are saved, that we have assurance of that. Look at this. Hunger for the Word of God. I mean, you ever get so hung to the Word of God that you've got every opportunity you have to hear it. You want to go and hear it, hear the Word of God preach, hear the Word of God taught, get, a, get an app on your phone and listen to messages, and, and, and you just want hung, so hungry for it. Maybe, maybe sometimes I get like this, we get cold, and we don't really want to hear the Word of God. We don't want to have to be convicted or have to hear the Word of God. But that's an evidence of the Word of God. Growing in obedience to God's commandments. The closer we get to Him, the more we get to know Him, the greater our knowledge of Him becomes, but also the greater responsibility we have as Christians of knowing more, knowing more what we should be doing. And another, another great one, uh, evidence of work, is love for other Christians. Love for other Christians. We love. Other. He that loveth his brother abideth in light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. That's an evidence of work of God in your life, loving other Christians. You love to be around believers. Obviously, I know you're here tonight, Bible study. You want to be here, and you love being around each other. Obviously, I know that. But many times, we get to the point where we don't want to be around Christians. We don't love each other. And, but that, that signs, maybe, not that we're not saved, but that we need to get back with the Lord and spend more time with Him. Our love for each other. As these evidence of salvation develop in our lives from the inside out, we have assurance that God is working in our lives. Guys, if there's some things in your life that are going on right now, some of these things, man, that's assurance tonight, knowing that, man, God is at work in my life, but I'm also saved. I'm thankful for that. We have the assurance because of God's chastening. Next one there. God's chastening because of his chastening. This is probably my least favorite one. No one likes to be chastened by the Lord. No one likes to be. I hated being whipped by my dad. I hated it. I hated, I hated getting spankings. I hated it. And I don't know why I always kept doing stupid stuff, but obviously I did. And so I hated I hated that. But I, I think the worst thing sometimes for me personally as a Christian is when the Lord chastens you. It's, Kenny, what are you doing? Man, what, are you, what are you thinking? You know, and you're so convicted, you can't sleep, and God's just chastening you, and get it right, and make it right, and that's that's the work of the Lord. But that's an assurance. It should be an assurance when God convicts you of sin, and you need to make those things right. That's a promise to us, an assurance. We will never lose our salvation because we sin. Since we cannot earn salvation by anything we do, we cannot lose it by what we do or don't do either. Just a child who disappoints her parents or something they do, still the parent's child, they're still the child. The child of God who sins is still God's child. The father-child relationship is still real, but the fellowship becomes strained. So the more we sin, that, 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 that separation from the Lord goes further and further. Thus thinking, well, maybe I'm not saved. But we need to keep that, keep that closeness to the Lord, keep that sin account short. When we're known sin, make them known to the Lord. Say, Lord, I've done those things wrong. Here's, they all, here what, here's what they all call them out. It's not okay for us just to keep sinning without caring. In fact, as loving Heavenly Father, God corrects us when we sin. That's the next word. Corrects us. Corrects us when we sin. And that correction is proof that we are his children. It's proof to us. It's, it's proving that when he corrects us and chastens us, it's proof that we are his children. Think about God recently, God was dealing with me about some things in my own life. And I'm like, man, thank you, God, for speaking to my heart and showing me these things that I need to make right. The very fact that God corrects us when we sin with, with the goal of restoring fellowship with him gives us assurance that we belong to him. So we see God wants us not only to be saved, but he has to have the assurance of salvation, to have absolute confidence in our hearts that we have a sure relationship with him. But these are some things, reminders tonight. Like I said, most of us, I believe all, the, all of you here are know the Lord, you're saved, you're living for the Lord, you want to live for him. But these are some assurances, man. When you get those days when you just don't feel like you're saved, and here's some promises, okay? Look at the next thing here. What, why should I be baptized? That's a great question. It's a great thing to come up. You know what? You ever wondered why we do baptisms, why we have new believers get baptized? We're going to delve into this a little bit tonight. We're almost done here. Baptism is an exciting step of obedience, all right? Obedience. Next blank there. Obedience. After you are saved because of an outward expression of your inward decision. It's an outward expression of what God has done in your life. It's a step of obedience. It's also a biblical command, but it's also a step of obedience. It's our expression. Uh, John 15, 14, you're my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, these are what we've done. We, we know that God, God wants us to obey him. 
While baptism is not a part of salvation, it's not a part of being saved, baptism is not what gets you to heaven, baptism doesn't get you a home in heaven, but it's part of it, it is an important step of obedience to Christ. All right, many, many other religions teach that in order to be in heaven or have a home in heaven, you've got be, to be baptized. It's not part of it. It's not what the Word of God teaches. It's by obeying Him. By, it's obedience. By following the Lord in believer's baptism, you are obeying Christ and showing others that you are glad He is your Savior. It's obedience. It's separate obedience. Many times in Scripture, we'll look at this here in a minute, but many, many times in Scriptures, when people were saved, they baptized them right there. That's why we, as soon as we have some folks in our church saved, they come to know the Lord. As soon as that happens, we, we try to get them to say, hey, look, here, the Bible commands us to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. Baptism is an identification. It's an identification. Explain there. The Bible teaches that baptism is a symbol, an outward expression of an inward decision. So it identifies us with Jesus. We say, hey, look, I love the Lord. I'm proclaiming that I'm a Christian. I'm saved. Here's, I'm showing it by, by getting baptized. All right, in the life of every Christian, baptism is an important first step of obedience to God that declares to others your faith in Christ. Think about this at a wedding when, when two exchange the wedding rings, the, um, the husband, between the husband and the wife, baptism, baptism identifies a Christian with Christ. We wear rings on marriage to represent we're married. We know that. We see that. It's a symbol of that. In the same way as baptism is a symbol of us, our inward expression, our outwardly showing that. Um, someone look up Romans 6, 3 through 5. Who wants to do that one? Romans 6, 3 through 5. Chris has got that. And someone look up Acts 2, 41 through 42. Dealing with this identification of baptism. Okay. Acts 2, 41 through 42. Who wants that? I'll do it. Okay. Almost done, guys. We're getting there. Romans 6, you got it? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. All right, just by baptism is your way of saying to everyone, Jesus saved me. I'm not ashamed of him. I want to live for him now. That's why you know we say, uh, now baptized you in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, raised to walk in newness of life. And you've heard the preacher say that. That's, that's what he's talking about right out of those verses there. Baptism also identifies a Christian with the local church and his doctrine. In the New Testament, people were baptized, were added to the church. So in our church, the way New Hope works is that um, as part of being a member, you know, we don't make a big deal about it, but it's part of being a member. We say that they have to be saved, they have to be baptized, and many times what happens is uh, we're dealing with Christians who maybe have never been baptized. So they come, they get baptized, they join our church, and, and it's just part of it. It's part of what, what we do and what the Bible is clear about that. Acts 2, 41 through 42. And they that glad, gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Can you imagine 3,000 people being baptized in our service? What in the world? That'd, that'd, that'd be a, a lot of, they'd be like, dunk and go, dunk and go. You know, that's what I think of when I see 3,000 people baptized, but they were out of the church the same day. That's, that's clear doctrine from the Word of God that when, when those were, they were baptized, they were out of the church, they were members of the church, it happened right then and there. And so that's proof from the Word of God. But that's an identification. Baptism is for every Christian. Next point. Every Christian. The Bible teaches that baptism is for anyone who has personally accepted Christ as Savior. Baptism does not save or wash away sins. It simply shows on the outside what Jesus already did on the inside like that. It shows on the outside what Jesus did on the inside. So baptism is for every Christian. There are three important reasons to be baptized. Number one here, Christ commands it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christ was our example, okay? So Christ commands, he's our example, then come to Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. So Jesus himself was baptized, but also believers in the Bible practice it. We, you know, many people think we just do stuff so because we're Baptists. But everything in our, in our Constitution, everything we go by is found by and in the Word of God. Everything, everything you see, we go by, what we do, the, 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 
the New Testament, you write exactly this. The Lord's Supper is found in the Word of God. It's found right there. And so people are like, well, why do you do that for? Well, it's found in the Word of God. We practice what the Word of God tells us to do. But believers in the Bible practice it. They, then they gladly received His Word, baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. If you trust Christ your Savior and have not been baptized since, since you should choose to be baptized as you can. Maybe someone here tonight hasn't been baptized. You know what? That's, man, we love to talk to you. Talk to Brother Lee or myself. But we love to talk to you about it. And uh, make that identification. You know what? It's not nothing to be shameful of. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, the water feels great, by the way. It's warm. So our mm -hmm. baptism. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that identifies yourself as a believer. Baptism should be by immersion. Immersion. Sorry. Immersion. I-M-M-E-R-S-I-O-N. Immersion. I-M-M-E-R-S-I-O-N. S-I-O-N. Yeah, it's hard one. The word baptize literally means to plunge or to dunk. The Bible teaches that you should be baptized in the water by immersion rather than by sprinkling because baptism is a picture of Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Only immersion correctly pictures this. So to pour water on somebody, to sprinkle it on somebody, to spray him, does not picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we go under the water, back up again. That's the same thing to represent when Christ died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. It's a picture of that, and um, that explains that. Other passages of Scripture that speak of baptism use the word buried, showing the baptism in the Bible days were understood to be by immersion. And there's some Scripture by it, okay? Baptism, next thing, baptism should take place soon after salvation. All right? Now, maybe you were one that you got saved and... And uh, maybe you just never made it, made it, made it, made it outwardly or should tell folks about it. Maybe it was a time, and you never did it. Maybe you got baptized two, three, two, three years later. For me, I was, I was saved back in March of 2010, and so I wanted to come home at my home church where my dad was pastoring at to be baptized. So I waited a couple months. I was home from school for a wedding, and I got baptized. Actually, on Easter Day, I got baptized. And um, so... Um, it should take place soon after. In the Bible, baptism always took place right after salvation. We just read that. It was an immediate and glad response of someone who found salvation and wanted to publicly identify with Jesus. All right, there's some scripture to represent that. Even if you were baptized before salvation, you need to be baptized in accordance with scripture after your salvation. Maybe you were one who's been baptized before you were saved or maybe happened before. You know what? The Bible is clear about when it's supposed to happen and what it's supposed to do. It should be after salvation. The Christian who refuses to be baptized could be compared to a wife who refuses to accept her wedding ring. How can a Christian's relationship with Christ start off right if they refuse to follow him or be ashamed of him before others? And what, it, it's a picture of obedience, guys. Look, if, if somebody refuses to be saved, I mean to be baptized from the very get-go, how are they really going to listen to God when he corrects them or chastens them? It's obedience, a picture of obedience, nothing to be ashamed of. When a Christian is not willing to be baptized, they are missing the blessing of committing themselves to Christ through obedience and losing the testimony that might have they might have through public identification with Him. They might lose it. They might lose their testimony, the opportunity to share. Hey, look, I'm a Christian. You know, a lot of times what happens when people come into the Lord and get saved in church, it sparks somebody else. You know what? Maybe I'm not saved, and so it just sparks a little spark. We've seen it in spurts in our church where uh, two or three people come to know the Lord and. And, uh, and they get baptized, and man, somebody says, well, I'm not going to be baptized. I'm going to be baptized. So it's kind of a, a good testimony. All right, here's a little application. Salvation is the greatest gift any person has ever been given. Amen to that. It's a free gift. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to do anything for it. It's a gift of salvation, free gift. But Satan will do everything he can to cause you to question if you're really a child of God. To avoid or counter those doubts, there are three important steps you can take. First of all, settle in your heart that salvation is forever. Record the day when you trust Jesus as your Savior somewhere. You will see it regularly. So I encourage you to remember that. I wrote it down. It was March 22nd, 2010. Uh, I remember it. It was yesterday. I can say that. Some people can't. But I encourage you, if you know it, write it down in your Bible. To take record of it. All right, number two, share your testimony uh, and your doubts uh, if and when they arise with a mature Christian. Maybe your pastor or the person who is discipling you would be a good person to share it with. Look, guys, if you have doubts, you have questions, man, don't be ashamed to say, look, Brother Kenny, Lee, Pastor, whatever, whoever you want to talk to about it, uh, say, look, you know what? I'm not really sure. I'm doubting some things. And we can take it to the Word of God and show you. I've dealt with so many people, so many Christians, so many teenagers, lots of adults who doubt their salvation. 
And so we can take them to the Word of God. So here are some promises that will show us that we are not, nothing can change that. And then lastly, publicly declare your salvation by being baptized. Baptism not only identifies you with Christ, you with Christ to others, but it is, has a way of, of cementing in your own heart the truth that Jesus has saved you forever. And so it, it just, it's an encouragement to yourself you know, hey, look, I'm saved. I'm baptized. I know that. I remember that day. I remember like it was yesterday. And, um, and so that's some little things there about our salvation. You look, guys, you know what? I said before, maybe, you, maybe you've not been baptized. Maybe you've not even been saved. And tonight could be the night. Don't hesitate. Don't leave here not knowing for sure where you're going to spend eternity. I mean, man, sometimes we take it for granted. We think everybody's saved. Everybody comes to church is saved on the way to heaven. But I, 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 I would almost promise you, I'm a, anything, there's probably a handful of people sitting in our church every Sunday who are lost as lost can be. Hmm. They've grown up on mom or dad's religion. They've followed their mom and dad's footsteps. Uh, they, they've come to church. They've been in the church for 30 years. And they, you know what? They, they could be in the church. They could do all the right things and put on a persona, like they're somebody. They sing the songs or in the choir. Um, they help with this. They, they, you know, they come to every, they're faithful, but they could be lost and on their way to hell. And, and so don't, don't just base it on something you know or something you think or you maybe and know for sure that you know that you know that you know. And uh, that's a reminder to us. I mean, I'm, I, I've been encouraged by this today as I've been chewing on today, thinking about this, and assurance of God's promises and his presence, and just knowing the Lord is there and near. Because uh, sometimes, you know what, you just feel down the dumps. You feel like God ain't near, but, but these are promises to us, promises from the word of God that we are saved, that we know for sure we can be saved. And uh, so if you have questions about anything, man, don't ever hesitate to ask. Don't ever hesitate to, to holler at us, all right? I think next week is on prayer. And for the league, I that we won't be here. Some of us won't be here because we're going to be on uh, camp. But uh, we'll make sure to record it, developing a prayer life. It's going to be a good one. So we'll make sure to record it and keep everybody up uh, with this. So.